Hi, uh, good afternoon everybody, and thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'm Mark Turner from the Carnegie Climate Governance Initiative. Uh, we've got a great panel today to talk about a pretty uh, important issue that is growing in uh, awareness around the world about uh, whether or not we would be ready for removing large amounts of CO2 from the atmosphere. So uh, with us, without further ado, we have uh, Telma Krug, uh, Vice Chair of the IPCC, Claire Fison. Uh, from Climate Analytics, who recently came out with a report on this. Uh, Bindu Bandari uh, from Climate Interactive, which launched its amazing new En-ROADS uh, model yesterday. And finally, Janos Pastor, the Executive Director of C2G. So I'll pass over to you now, Atelma, if I may. Thank you. Okay. It's, it's, automatic. Yeah? it's automatic. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. And I have to do a miracle here, which is to talk about this in four minutes. So basically, I think I want to pave the way in terms of CDR and the different implications that we have depending on the pathway that we go. And I will take from the IPCC Special Report 1.5 some elements that we have there. So we say that uh, you know, pathways that are consistent with this 1.5 global warming above pre-industrial time or levels can be, uh, can be identified in the, a range of assumptions. And these assumptions relate to economic growth, technology developments, and uh, in lifestyle. Who is changing? Next one. Yeah. So what you see on the left-hand side, very quickly, uh, is all the pathways that IPCC have assessed that limit global warming to 1.5. Some of these uh, are very smooth that we are going to see. Uh, and others, we, we say they are overshoot scenarios where temperature goes a little bit beyond 1.5 and then we need to use some measures to pull down this temperature increase so that at the end of the century it limits to 1.5. So you see there four P1, P2, P3, P4, which are dif four different scenarios that, that we have picked to illustrate uh, what the scenarios are and what these tra trajectories all lead to 1.5 at the end of the century. So what you see, the first one on the left hand side is a scenario P1 and what you see in the stream right side is scenario P4. I'm going to give the characteristics in the next slide of these two ways to go forward. What you see in colors is the use of CDR. In this case, for the 1.5, the assessed uh, CDR measures were basically forestation, reforestation, and the bioenergy with capture and storage of CO2, but also only bioenergy. So if we look at, at, at the first one on the left-hand side, where we use very little CDR, we have these characteristics, a peak and decline in population, high income to reduce the inequalities, effective land use regulation, less uh, resource intensive consumption, free trade, but I say that most important of all is rapid decarbonization. On the other extreme, not only you go to high population, low income, continued inequalities, material intensive consumption, barriers to trade, low rates of technology change. So all these have different impacts in terms of scenarios. It's how we see that the, how the future can evolve with different implications on how much CDR would be needed. So as I showed here, you see uh, on the P4, which is this scenario that basically is very intensive in energy, uh, very, you know, uh, in transportation, basically using a lot of uh, fossil fuels, you see that in yellow, you have how much BECs are projected to use under this scenario, right? BECs being bioenergy with capture and storage of CO2. And it's still a little bit of... Uh, of, um, of afforestation, reforestation. All pathways that IPCC assessed that limit global warming to 1.5, they, they have some, uh, they use CDR to some extent, all of them. So the larger and longer the overshoot going beyond the 1.5 and then trying to bring it back, the greater is gonna be the reliance on the CDR measures later on the century. It can have 
as per the IPCC, significant impacts on land, food, and water security, ecosystems, and biodiversity. However, it also acknowledges that some agriculture, forest, and other land use measures as restoration of natural ecosystems could have some uh, contribution. Finally, we see that uh, regardless, so responding objectively to the question, I know I, I am beyond 30 seconds, I read there, for a small scale it might be, but still we have some elements that we, that we see are requirements that are needed anyway. So this relates to the governance of land use that IPCC stresses in the 1.5 report and also in the land report. What do we mean by governance? Accountable, multi-level governance that includes non-state actors, industry, civil society, scientific institutions. What you see there, improved climate education and strengthened climate monitoring and evaluation systems, they are all part of a governance system that are required regardless of the amount of the CDR that we will need to use anyway. To finalize the response is, the IPCC is there, it says that for the large scale use of CDR, the science is not mature enough to let us know the potential impacts that these can have on land, land degradation, food insecurity, biodiversity. So it's still a lot of research to be done in that area. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Thelma. Um, so if we could move to Claire now uh, from Climate Analytics, and if you could talk a little bit about this uh, recent report that you did. Um, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so my first point follows on very well from what Thelma had to say. The best way to govern CDR is to limit the need for it by rapidly reducing our emissions in line with what was agreed in Paris. As we all know, current emissions reduction targets put us on track for warming of twice the 1.5 degree limit. Marginal improvements in these commitments just won't be enough, and we can't rely on CDR to get us back on track because, as Thelma said, there are limits to how much CDR can be deployed sustainably. At this point, only transformational improvements in NDCs will allow us to limit warming to 1.5 and avoid the need for very large-scale carbon removals. So even if we cut emissions quickly, the IPCC has shown, as Thelma also said, that we have left it too late to avoid CDR altogether. So we need to be able to plan and monitor the use and effects of CDR deployment in a way that helps us to keep to the 1.5 limit in a sustainable manner. Under the Paris Agreement, we have a number of relevant elements for governing CDR, which we have discussed in our report, and I'll go through a few of these now. For example, uh, we have mitigation targets in the form of NDCs, which are important for tracking where we're heading. But the current NDCs are difficult to compare, they're difficult to aggregate, and they contain very little information on CDR. The Katowice Rulebook will improve the clarity of these targets to a certain extent, but there is no requirement for governments to say how much CDR they plan to use. And flexible accounting rules mean that governments can choose how they include removals in their targets. Add to this that governments may be able to trade removals under the Article 6 market mechanisms, and it becomes very difficult to track the extent to which governments are planning to offset emissions rather than reduce them. We also have a transparency framework for tracking progress against the NDC targets and for monitoring trends in carbon flows. An important innovation in the Katowice rules is that governments have to provide a summary of their NDC emissions balance. If designed well, this would give us a clear picture of what removals are being used towards NDC targets. The key challenge here is that many developing countries face difficulties in producing regular, reliable, and complete greenhouse gas inventories. And this is an important consideration for governments and companies planning to offset their emissions with removals in developing countries. Let's take Bioenergy with Carbon Capture, or BECS, as an example. Accounting for the life cycle impacts of BECS may be unreliable if the country where bioenergy crops are grown does not have the capacity to accurately monitor the carbon intensity of their biomass production, or if they don't include the land sector in their NDC. If the biomass is then shipped to another country for combustion and carbon capture, the receiving country could account the CDR benefits, while the adverse effects of using more carbon intensive biomass for BECS might be unaccounted for. In a similar vein, a number of governments and companies, including many fossil fuel companies, are proposing to use nature-based solutions to compensate for continued fossil fuel emissions. 
but a clear message of the IPCC's latest special reports is that in a world where warming exceeds 1.5 degrees, the associated impacts of climate change on ecosystems would hamper their ability to sequester carbon and instead cause carbon to be released to the atmosphere. This means that any plans to use nature-based solutions that are not accompanied by action to rapidly reduce emissions in all other sectors are based on false pretenses. This impermanence issue is a major governance challenge. Under present reporting requirements, governments don't need to account for losses of carbon from natural disturbances like fires and droughts. So as climate change makes these events more frequent, removals that have been counted towards NDC targets could be re-released without appearing anywhere in the NDC accounts. And this brings me to the Paris Agreement's market mechanisms. It's a no-brainer that the rules these gov that govern these need to be robust, with no possibilities for double counting, and safeguards in place to ensure that governments cannot trade removals that are impermanent, inaccurately measured, or that have adverse impacts on sustainable development. It remains to be seen whether or not these criteria will be met. So what can we do about all these gaps and challenges? Very quickly. First, act fast, ramp up emission, minimize the amount of CDR that we need. Second, enhance monitoring and reporting capacities to close information gaps. Third, develop and use robust accounting rules for tracking carbon emissions and removals. And finally, we need incentives for protecting and restoring ecosystems, but without such actions being used to offset fossil fuel emissions. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Claire. Now, if we can move on to uh, Bindu, uh, who can tell us a little bit about how she has encountered educating and explaining uh, to people uh, the role that CO2 removal might play in a very uh, interesting interactive tool uh, that has just been released yesterday called En-ROADS. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Bindu Vandari, and I work with Climate Interactive. Uh, so Climate Interactive is a think tank uh, that uh, develops interactive tools uh, that shows various outcomes of uh, climate outcomes uh, with the changes in the land use, energy, energy, our consumption pattern. And just yesterday only, just like Mark mentioned, we released our newest simulator called uh, Enroads. So Enroads is the global climate simulator, which is a freely available tool developed together with our partner, MIT Sloan. And what uh, I'm going to do here is very quickly show you the demo of how different reductions measures and removal measures uh, have impact on the future cli climate scenarios. So I'm going to show you there uh, in the screen, as you can see on the left, uh, you can see different. Should I start the video? Uh, yes. So it's a quick demo. It's a video. Uh, just so as you can see, uh, we are trying to play with say highly taxing coal and taxing coal how it impacts as you can see on the right side you can see how greenhouse gas net emissions see the energy carbon dioxide uh, area shrink on the right as we take more and more measures to reduce the emissions and as we have been talking about that there will be some form of technological uh, carbon dioxide removal required to the pathway to limit one, to 1.5 you can see how technological carbon dioxide removal has impact on the right. You can see how we are moving to net uh, negative emissions from the net emissions. And on the left, you can see how different BICs, biochar, mineralization, the area increasing from zero to nearly 15 gigatons carbon dioxide per year. So if you would like to hit the replay button, there you can see. And also you can, what you can do next is change the assumptions, what we have used in this model. And say we have used 2.8 gigatons, and you can put it to the maximum of 4.9 gigatons per, yeah, per year for direct year capture. And where did we get this data from? It's a very transparent tool. You can see the source, the Royal Society and Royal Academy of Engineering. So that is the source. So it's a very transparent tool. You can play with uh, different parameters, change the assumptions. And in the detailed settings, you can even try to specify which measures you would like to see and see the related graphs. And you can share the scenario in Facebook, Twitter, and also copy the scenario link and email it to, email it to your friends or whoever you would want to. Uh, since I, have, I had limited time, I saw this quick demo, but if you'd like to know more, please feel free to log into nrose.org, n-rose.org, and uh, feel free to catch in later to know more. Thank you so much. 
Thank you very much indeed. That was a, a fabulous, uh, crisp presentation of what you guys do. Um, and finally, uh, Janusz Pastor, who's the Executive Director of uh, Carnegie Climate Governance Initiative, uh, will wrap this section up before questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mark, and <clears throat> good afternoon. I'm afraid my presentation will be less exciting than the one we just heard, but uh, I hope this will contribute. I'd like to share a few thoughts about uh, the governance of these uh, removal technologies. First, uh, just to recall that why do we need to talk about this at all? I think, uh, first of all, Telba in her presentation made it very clear uh, that we need to, uh, and emission reductions are key, but alone is insufficient. We need carbon dioxide removal in all the scenarios, and the longer we wait with the emission reductions, the more uh, CDR we have to reduce. Uh, we also know that since the summit of the Secretary General that over 70 countries have uh, committed to doing net zero emissions by 2050, and they'll have to do lots of things about that, but that will require some governance issues to be resolved, some of which uh, we just heard. In, uh, in particular from Claire and her presentation. Now, the, some of the key governance issues, just to summarize so that we don't forget them. First of all, we have technology, uh, technical related issues like accounting, monitoring, measurement, things like that. They have to be sorted out. But we also have a category which is a bit more political of who is responsible, who is going to pay, and how are we going to organize technical cooperation around them. And thirdly, and that was also embedded in the presentations before, how do we integrate the carbon objectives with the other objectives under the Sustainable Development Goals? Now, uh, the best way to maybe look at this is to look at more specifically nature-based solutions, because a lot of people are talking about nature-based solutions. And uh, uh, we need to look at that. Now, we know that they can help. They can help to uh, contribute to the solution of these problems. But the first question is, how much can they help? And there's a debate about that. Uh, but uh, let's see what they are. Now, we know that there are benefits and there are risks. There are synergies with other positive issues, uh, side benefits, but there are also trade-offs that one has to deal with. And the question is how to manage these, because we want as many benefits as possible, as many synergies, but as little trade-offs as possible. And uh, some of the key areas that arise out of nature-based solution, first of all, is land, land use. Land is needed for many things. Uh, it's needed for livelihoods of people, for development. Uh, then there is the question of biodiversity. Depending on what kind of options we uh, use, we might end up having substantial impacts on biodiversity. And of course, food. Land and water, oceans, are both used for, to produce food and to ensure food security. And then, of course, land and also oceans in many places have cultural, uh, religious significance and human rights implications. So these are the kind of areas. And uh, we're not going to suggest what are the solutions, but we do ask what are the key questions we need to ask as we launch these kind of activities. What is the potential of nature-based solution uh, solutions versus the needs? And what is the permanence? How long will they last? Then how do you manage this system of uh, the synergies and the trade-offs with the other SDGs? It's about monitoring, it's about policies to encourage the synergies and the co-benefits, and about policies to deal with the trade-offs. And how to direct and scale up finance. And of course, this has institutional questions, and uh, particularly within the UNFCCC process, how we can deal with some of these issues, but some of them go way beyond this process, such as the biodiversity, such as FAO, and maybe other intergovernmental processes as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, just briefly, we have got a lot of information on our website and infographics and evidence briefs and policy briefs, and I would uh, highly uh, encourage you to take a look. Um, but if we could open the floor to questions. Uh, has anybody got a question? So you, sir, over there. And if you could kindly introduce yourself, uh, your affiliation, and keep it to a fairly brief question. Thank you. Albert Bates, is it on? Yeah. 
Albert Bates with the Global Eco Village Network and the International Biochar Initiative. And I saw on the slide that Janos put up uh, that you had biochar with agriculture and soil sequestration. That's a very limited use, I would say, because you're only looking at uh, five to seven gigatons carbon dioxide removal per year with that. Biochar used in cements, concrete, asphalt, um, the built environment, uh, 3D printing for biopolymers. Biochar in those applications has 50 to 60 gigatons CO2 potential removal per year. So uh, I, w I think this limitation is based on science that's 10 years old and that we actually need to look at what the concrete industry is doing, what the um, bioplastics industry is doing with biochar. And the feedstocks is an issue when we get to that, yeah? But so seaweed, um, waste products like biosolids from municipal sewage, yeah. Th thank you very much. Uh, did you want to respond to that, Janos? Just, just to, to agree, this is a, 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 absolutely right. There's lots of new things happening uh, in this area and without getting into the specific details of what you said, but we need to be open to see the results of new research, new technologies. There's a lot happening in this area. Thank you. Great. Is there anybody else? Uh, yes, you, sir, on the left, Victor. <laughs> Thank you, Victor Yosho from Climates. My question relates more to the socializing this, this topic and aspect among young people and newer generations. And my question is here, um, when it comes to the U part of CCUS and carbon tech, do you plan to, uh, to socialize this side of the coin? Um, I'm just thinking for young people, this might be uh, a more attractive intro into carbon removal, utilization and storage as, as it also relates with technology as well as it's a, it's a productive way of using it. And we know that carbon tech is projected to be a significant <coughs> market only later, which might be an investment barrier for those who have the means today. So very much touches Good. upon. Great, thank you very much, Victor. And if I could ask uh, for any further questions, perhaps we'll take two more and then have a final quick through to answer these questions because we haven't got much time left. So you, sir, over there, please. Justin Ginetti, Justin Ginetti from the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center. I have a question for Bindu, two-part question. Um, what, what, can you tell us uh, what you're doing to uh, bring such a useful tool like En-ROADS into the hands of decision makers and policy makers? Uh, and others, and what are you doing to stimulate demand for use of this kind of uh, tools and technology to actually use evidence uh, in this decision-making process more transparently? Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. And if we could take one last question, and then I'll give everybody a, a chance for a one-minute wrap-up. Are there any more questions? Great. Then if I could ask each of our panelists to maybe answer the two questions and anything finally want to say in about 30 seconds or so, that should take us to the time. Thank you. Uh, Thelma. Oh, perhaps Bindu first? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so what we have been doing is uh, we have done several uh, pilot tests and we have uh, already ran Enroads in workshop and uh, game format with different user groups, uh, youths, uh, educators, policymakers, my colleagues did with the senators from the US and in different parts. Uh, but we are also launching this uh, training series where people can really get into deeper insights. Uh, the, and we are launching Enroads Climate, what we call as Enroads Climate Ambassadors. So this will be a global network and we have opened the application like people are signing. We, in fact, I study only had webinar where people, more than 500 people signed up and we have more of this coming. So what we are trying to do is build a really global network so that it replicates. It's not just us who are spreading the words, but there are other partners around. So we are looking into every opportunities to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh Janos next? Yeah, briefly, just Victor's question. Uh, you're absolutely right. This is a key issue about uh, use of carbon, uh, uh, and uh, that could make the economics much more interesting. Now, from our perspective, governance is something much broader than just regulating the technology. It's about engaging different stakeholders and getting them excited about different parts of the problem. And if we can get them excited by saying there is some possibility for engagement because it's going to give you good services, we can use this carbon, then of course, it's is definitely much more interesting. It is not going to solve all our problems. Uh, according to one specialist in this area, you're talking about a gigaton. Uh, that's a gigaton. It's a lot. Okay, so let's see what we can do.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Claire, would you like to add something? Um, yeah, just very briefly, I guess, on these, on these kind of innovations in biochar and carbon capture and utilization, um, I, I really want to emphasize the need to monitor these and the need to be innovative in how we can ensure that our measurements are accurate because we don't want to go down a hole where we think we're removing things, but we're actually not. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And perhaps the final word to uh, Tilma. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. So, so thank you, Mark. So, yeah, in, indeed, I think that, you know, it, it's uh, regardless of the pathway we will go, as I mentioned, we will have to rely on some sort of CDR, basically for two things. One, to, one, one to help countries to reach the zero net that we are expecting to have in all pathways around 2050, and also to, uh, to offset some of the residual CO2 emissions that uh, in some sectors that is not going to be possible. So reliance on CDR is something that we see as basically inevitable with these both tracks. Uh, but the more we do now, the more we reduce emissions, obviously the less we expect on potential impacts on land, on biodiversity, food security, land degradation, as I have mentioned before. So the idea is reduce now and avoid to have more impacts in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all of your contributions. So please, uh, we've got to end now, but we have a lot of information. We'd be delighted to sort out any further uh, interviews, discussions, uh, help you out with any questions you may have on this. So I think this is uh, the beginning of a very big conversation and all of society will need to be involved. So please, please feel free to come and get involved and uh, ask us uh, how we might help. Thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye. Uh,